Hey guys, what's up? It's your good buddy Sam, and it's time for another exciting Maximus P tutorial. And my roommate will not ruin this take, I promise. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, all the lovely stuff that you guys have said about my videos. Um, as a result of it, I got to go into uh, Cycling74 and meet with the CTO, and actually got to see some cool new features in Max 6, which is going to be awesome. You all should buy it for double the price, triple the price. Give them as much money as you can, because they're doing a really good job. Um, Sorry, I got distracted. Anyway, so yeah, thanks for the support, and um, yeah, let's get started. So this is going to be a little tutorial on actually Max 4 Live and a little bit of Ableton Live, um, which, full disclosure, I suck at. Um, I admit that I'm the fiery champion of everything Max MSP, but when it comes to Ableton Live, it's a little touch and go. So this will be less of, maybe less of a tutorial and more of a more of a shared experience. It'll be a very San Francisco shared organic. Um, crowdsource, whatever. We'll learn together. It'll be fun. Sorry. Right. So, uh, what I'm going to show you is how to work a little bit with the live object model, um, listen to things in live in Max, and set things in live from Max. So, to get started, let's start by making a 2D wave tilde object. Um, don't argue, just do it. Do as I say. And um, so, the 2D wave object, what it is, is it's an uh, object that reads from a wave table, not unlike play tilde, but 2D wave gives you a 2D wavetable. What that means is it takes the audio sample you give it and chops it into, uh, wow, sorry, takes the uh, wavetable you give it, chops it into rows, and then reads from two different phasers. One phaser tells it where to read in a specific row, and that's the one that actually samples, and the other phaser tells it which row to read from. So you can get these cool kind of glitchy effects, um, glitchy ambient effects. I'll show you what that means. So the arguments you give it are where you want to start in your um, audio file. I happen to know this one get, gets good at about 800 milliseconds. Where to end, again, 3200, just something I found before. The number of channels and the number of rows. Uh, I happen to know 6 is going to sound pretty cool. So anyway, um, now let's make a buffer. Buffer tilde, samp, and these don't matter because I'm going to replace it. Uh, so here's the audio file I'm going to use. Um, it sounds like this, a little guitar loop. You get the idea. So uh, let's go ahead and fill our buffer up with that delightful little sound. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and now we need a gain. We need another gain. Oh my god. Someone uh, posted a comment that I should just automate this process of making um, gains and hooking up the EZDAC because it's slow and really boring and pointless. And that person's right, but also I'm not going to do it. So that's all hooked up, and now we have a phaser. Uh, say two point. Remember, this is the phaser that actually is going to sample, and then this phaser determines where we're reading in our mm. wavetable. Oh, sorry, getting a phone call. So, um, anyways, so this means that it's going to uh, read each slice of our wavetable twice a second, and it's going to read through the whole thing in eight seconds. That's what, no, sorry, four seconds. That's what this phaser means. So here's what that sounds like. So hopefully you can hear what's going on and hear, I, I like that sort of poppy glitchy sound that comes out of it. Anyway, so having done that, uh, the next thing you want to do is sort of abstract this out uh, up a couple layers, and I want to control um, both the beats per minute of this little loop as it runs and uh, how many beats I get uh, get per phrase. And So what I mean by a beat here is every time you hear that pop, which is which happens when this phaser wraps back around to the beginning, and by phrase I mean how long it takes this phaser to go uh, from the beginning to the end, because that coincides with our wavetable going, our reading our wavetable from one end to the other. So it's going to make two controls up here, and this one I will label beats per minute, or just BPM for short because it's 2011 and no one has time, and this is going to be um, beats per phrase. Beats per phrase, or beats pre-phrase, whatever, no one cares. So uh, this is just, this is an easy conversion. To get the um, frequency for this phaser, we take the beats per minute and divide by 60, obviously. And, oh, that's wrong. And um, to get the number of those beats that we're going to have in a given phrase is just the beats per minute divided by beats per phrase. Um, complicated slightly that if we set beats to phrase to zero by accident, we'll get a division by zero, and this phaser will be set to infinite, and then it will be hosed until we reset that phaser by making a new phaser object. Um, anyway, so point being, I'm going to make a pack here. Ah, crap. Make a pack here so that when either one of these changes, um, 
the uh, we'll get uh, an output, and then I'm going to unpack that. Unpack float float and uh, cell zero, so that if this one is zero, I'm going to replace that zero with a one. Otherwise, just pass it straight through. Divided by uh, one one into this phaser. And now uh, we're done. Okay, cool. So now I can have this sample playing, change the um, beats per minute to 120. Something has gone wrong. God, what happened? Oh, I see. Huh, lol. Anyway, cool. So now you can hear this is the original 8B phrase we had to begin with. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We can set this to lower and only get 4 beats. Or longer and get more beats, and we can change the beats per minute. The pitch changes, but whatever, it's fine. Anyway, so now that we've done all this work, the next thing you want to do, obviously, is take this and get it into Ableton Live. So how do we do that? Well, let's we'll start by copying all this and then switching over to Ableton Live. Uh, I have a little set set up here already, and what I want to do is drop a max effect here. Um, so to do that, we'll, we'll drop, I want to drop an instance of a max patch uh, into my device rack here and play with it in Ableton Live. So to do that, uh, I want to come up to Live Devices here, go down to Audio Effects, and grab the max audio effect, drag and drop it into this slot here. And this little uh, instance of a max patch will appear here, which is pretty slick. Um, so the max audio effect, sorry, if you click this um, little icon here, it will launch, launch an instance of max for live um, And you can actually edit this patch directly, and the changes you do here will immediately take place and be audible in Ableton Live. So it's pretty sweet. Uh, plug in up here, that's where audio comes into your max patch. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Plug in up here, that's where audio comes into your max patch. And plug out is where you send the affected audio when you're done. Uh, we're not actually going to go in for that. We're just going to make all, our, make all the audio ourselves and output it all the time. Uh, plug out. Nice. Um, throw that at the bottom, and then go ahead and paste that max patch. Delete this output because that's not how we're making sound anymore. Move this buffer over here because, um, yeah, replace, fill it in with that guitar loop. And now we should be ready to make sound all over again, all over again in Ableton Live. You can see it's actually a live instrument, so I can change the volume and the slider. Sounds going through this whole processing chain. Um, everything's happening. So, like, we're already done. We've already took. Um, I can't shut this up now. Anyway, so we're basically done. I mean, we got this thing into live, and, um, you know, uh, that's that. So, um, I'm trying to decide whether to cut the video here or just keep going. I'll just keep going. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and make a toggle here so that we can um, shut off all this audio. Um, otherwise, it's going to go not only, uh, it's going to go all the time, even when we're not playing in Ableton. That will suck. Um, do this like this, this like this. So now what I want to do is, um, here's the problem situation we're in now. This is 120 beats per minute. If I set Ableton to 120 beats per minute and then play this drum loop that I've made in Ableton, um, then the two will be in sync and we'll hear them uh, as in sync. But then if I change the speed in live, now the drum loop and the max loop are out of sync and everything is hosed. Um, so what we need to do, we need a way to listen to the um, uh, tempo in Ableton Live and change the max tempo whenever that changes. So to do that we're going to take advantage of what's called the live object model. And um, this very complicated looking thing here is actually a very simple and very elegant way to describe the entire Ableton Live state as a branching structure of objects with um, uh, parent objects and child objects. So for example if you wanted to find the tempo, uh, oh no, say we wanted to look at the first device of the first track. We could, uh, the path that describes that track would be the live set, song number one, track number one, device number one. Um, and then we could operate on that thing from within max. In this instance, we're interested in 
a parameter of the live set um, called tempo. So to get to that thing, what we're going to do is make use of the live.path object and the live.observer object. Live.path takes um, a path and outputs an ID, or that ID is a unique tag for that specific uh, member of the live object model. So in this case, we'll send it the argument path live underscore set, and that will return a um, ID of a live set. And we'll make a live.observer. Live.observer takes uh, arguments or uh, responds to sends inputs in its left inlet to the object specified by its right inlet. So when we um, send live.set out of this live path, now when we send path live to path live set to live path, live path will output an ID through this outlet, and now our live observer represents the entire live set. So we can send it a message like um, uh, property tempo, and it will spit back the tempo. 129, which is amazing. It's, just, it's great. And live.observer has the um, added bonus that it will also watch that parameter for us, uh, which is pretty sweet. So I'm just going to set this up to always watch that tempo. To do that, I'm going to move property tempo down here. And after live path here, trigger bang list. So the first thing it will do is send the list, uh, send the ID to live observer, and then bang this property tempo. So it's watching the tempo. And then I want to send that tempo up here to our beats per minute and add a load bang so that um, this will get bang right when the patch loads up so we don't have to actually configure anything more than once. Okay, and now if we let's make sure this is set and jump back to Ableton and hit play. And uh, turn this one. Now we can change the tempo. And everything stays in sync. Which is pretty sweet. Um, so now, before we before we get finished here, I get a little time left. Before we finish, um, supposing I also had a a uh, corny little um, piano loop that I wanted to go with this audio track that sounded like this. Now you'll hear that um, when the tempo is set correctly, uh, the everything actually sounds relatively decent together. Um, Start playing the max loop. Then we get But um, if I change the tempo. If I change the tempo, then because the um, because the pitch of the this little max loop here changes, the max and the uh, piano thing aren't in sync anymore. They aren't uh, in the same key anymore, and it sounds terrible. Um, so to fix that, we want to be able to when we change the tempo here, uh, set the uh, transposition down here uh, on this acoustic piano um, loop. So to do that, we're going to use live.object. Live.object works the same way, basic way, as um, live.observer, where you specify an ID using live.path, and then you're able to act on the live.object max object as if it represented the, uh, well, since it does represent the actual live object in Ableton Live. Um, so we're going to send this path live set again, but this time we want track uh, we're going to go look at the tracks and then get track number two because um, these things index from zero. So this is track zero, track one, track two, the piano. And we want devices, um, not this device, not this device, but this device. That's devices two. And then I happen to know that the transposition is the 11th parameter, parameters 11. And you can, I'll show you how to figure out what that is in a second. So anyway, you send that to live.path, live.path, um, will uh, output an ID, and you send that ID into the right inlet of live.object. And then, once you've done that, 
um, live.object should represent a, a max uh, instance uh, something in Ableton Live, a parameter in Ableton Live, um, and you can query it with get value. I don't know, get name, how about? And it will tell us the name of that parameter, which in this case is transpose. We nailed it. Um, and we can do now set value 6, and if we push this and jump over to Ableton, you see the transposition is actually, in fact, bumped up to 6. Um, so now we can use that uh, to make sure these two always stay in key. To do that, I'm going to take the beats per minute here, and since I know they're in key at 127 beats per minute, I can take the beats per minute here, divide by 127, um, take the uh, log base 2 of that number, which is just uh, the log base 10 of the number divided by log base 2 of that number. A little math, don't be afraid. And then uh, multiply that by 12. And that's how far we need to transpose up or down. So now we round that off to the nearest integer, truncate, and we can send that straight into Ableton Live. Uh, one catch here is that because this is all being updated, so what's going to happen is if we change the tempo in Ableton, that's going to propagate here to change the speeds per minute, and then down here and try to set something in Ableton. So a message coming from Ableton is going to trigger us to change something in Ableton. And Ableton doesn't like that, and it will complain, and it will say that we can't do that and won't actually change the parameter, probably because it's afraid of an infinite loop and exploding. Um, because unlike Max, Ableton Live is afraid of blowing up and crashing. Um, so we can fix that with a pipe object. So this pipe will delay the output uh, by one millisecond, uh, unfortunately, but it will also make it seem to Ableton Live as if this message is really coming from Max, when in fact it's um, coming from Ableton Live. So now I'm going to add a load bank here so this loads up. And you should see that when we change the tempo now, the transposition of this um, piano loop here will change. everything in sync and on key and the entire world happy, well-fed, and cooperative. So there you go. That's a quick introduction to listening to parameters from Ableton Live, um, writing those parameters back to live, and in general just having a lovely good time um, this long weekend. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching guys and thanks for the continued support. Uh, I hope to bring you some cool new Max features and um, yeah, have an awesome weekend. Take it easy.